Hi, and welcome to the first lecture of our 2020 workshop series at ICDSS. I'm William, and today we'll be covering Python for Data Science, so you can learn about the fundamentals before going further into data science. We will be starting with the basics of Python programming, and then looking into how to use NumPy for computation and pandas for managing data. Note that those lectures run live every week or two, so make sure to subscribe to our mailing list to stay informed of the upcoming lectures. To start off, visit our GitHub by typing GitHub ICDSS and clicking the link with Imperial College Data Science Society. You'll find a, a repo with all of our workshops in them and a binder link here. Click Launch Binder and that will bring you to that page which will then bring you to our Jupyter Notebooks. It might take a bit of time to load, but once that's loaded, you'll arrive at that page. Here, you have a file structure with a data directory that contains uh, some data sets that will get expanded over time as we add lectures. And you also have the notebooks directory. If you, if you click that, you'll get workshop one, and this is the one for today. So click that, and we'll be using data science python .ipython notebook. So I'll just open that. And here we have all the material we'll be covering today. So let's start with some quick basics for Python. First off, most importantly, as in many languages, we have variables. Variables really just allow you to store any value with the label, and that can be used later on uh, for other operations. We have multiple types of variables, for instance, integers, floating point numbers, which are just decimal numbers, strings, which are chains of uh, characters or text, lists, which use the square bracket notation and can contain any number of uh, elements, and dictionaries, which hold key value pairs. For instance, here, my dictionary has two entries, uh, Alice and Bob, which are the keys, and that map to respectively to 20 and 21. The way uh, notebooks work is if I want to run that cell, I just hit Control Enter and that will run it. So here, printing those values, uh, I get as expected. So this just prints uh, the value that is stored in my int, the value that is stored in my float. Same for string. Now for lists, we use the square bracket notation here to access element at index 1. Note that lists are zero indexed, meaning they start at zero. So that will actually be the second element. If you see here, it prints 23, which is the second element. Quite similarly for dictionaries, we use the square bracket notation to specify a key and get the value in return. So here we use the key Bob that is mapped to 21. And so as output, we get 21. Variables. Uh, can be used with uh, operators and uh, assembled and worked uh, together. So here are just a very simple example. I have two variables, one and two. I use the plus operator, print the results, and that gives me three. But I could do anything else, like division, multiplication. Um, and uh, we'll see uh, later uh, much more uh, uh, advanced uses of uh, variables, of course. Very importantly, uh, control flow allows you to use uh, boolean conditions, so true or false, to evaluate different paths or parts of the code. So here, as an example, I just have a variable age that holds 20. If that age is uh, smaller than 18, I print your own 18. If it is greater or equal than 18 and smaller than 40, so notice the boolean operator and here, then I print your between 18 and 40 and otherwise so if that if the if test false if the elif test false elif stands for else if then i will be running the else statement if this condition is true i won't be checking the elif condition nor the else so here i will just be branching into a single one of uh, those condition statements so if i run that I get your between 18 and 40 because that the first one tests false that tests true and so then everything else is skipped if i say 16 it says you're under 18 so that one is true so this runs here 
but then everything else is skipped. We also have loops, which allow us to repeat code until a certain condition is uh, satisfied. The two main types of loops are while loops and for loops. So while loops are the simplest, we just use the while keyword with a boolean expression again. And while this expression is true, we execute this code. So if I run that, we have variables that starts at zero. While counter is strictly smaller than five, I print the value of counter and I increment it by one. This notation is shorthand for this. So just adding one. And so you can see this just prints zero to four. For loops are used a lot for lists because they are very useful to sequentially uh, iterate through them. So I have a list here that I store in my variable lms and using that notation for lm in lms, what I do is that I sequentially uh, put every value in lm. So if I run that, lm will consecutively take the value for and run the what's in the body of the of the loop then we'll take the value uh, 334 and run this and then take the value 56 and run this and this is very useful for everything related uh, to this another example we could have is uh, the range notation here uh, that allows me to to iterate from zero to a certain number. So here you see zero to, uh, to nine. Again, we don't go up to 10 because uh, arrays are zero indexed. What the range function really does is um, create an array for you. So if I print this, actually range returns me a list from zero to nine. So it's just a shorthand for creating a big list and iterating over it. It has multiple parameters. I can pass in uh, the beginning, the end, and the step. Like that. So this means I start a one until nine exclusive with a step of two. So I get those values, one, three, five, seven. Next up, very importantly, we have uh, functions which allow us to define routines uh, that we can execute uh, over and over any number of time. So this really allows us to reuse code efficiently. The way the syntax works is that I use the def keyword, then I specify the name of my function. Between brackets, I specify any argument or parameters that the function takes in. And then I use the return keyword. I could do uh, any sort of computation here, just like write some code. And then I use the return keyword to specify the output of the function. So here I have my add function that takes in two parameters, input one and input two, and returns the sum of the, those two parameters. I define a res variable for result, which is equal to add one and two. So it will take, it will store whatever my add function returns as output with those input parameters. And if I run that, unsurprisingly, I get three. Uh, there are also what we call inline or anonymous or lambda functions, which are just uh, a shorthand for writing functions. For instance, if we look at the example of the map function, which is used a lot in what's called uh, functional programming, Map is a function that takes in two parameters. First parameter is a function itself, and the second parameter is a list. What map does is it returns a list, a new list, with the past in function applied to every member of the past in list. As an example, I have a list here with one, two, three, and I set it as equal to map that function over the list. So the way the notation works here is I declare lambda, so I'm creating a new anonymous function. That, so this is just like 
a one-time use uh, throwaway function. Uh, I cannot call it after, it's just valid here. So that function takes in one parameter x and returns x plus one. So it's really just an easy way to write a quick throwaway function. So that's my function and I apply it to my list and uh, it returns me everything plus one. So that function applied to every consecutive element of that list. I could, for instance, have times two and I uh, have the result 246. Now we've seen what we can do with basic types like integers, floats, strings, lists. Now we'll see about classes which allow us to compose many types and functions and create some much more complex types. So the way a class works is that I use the class keyword to create my class. And here I will have a collection of variables, which in that context are called attributes, and a collection of functions that act on, on those attributes that in the context of a class we call methods. So here I have my class person and I define a underscore underscore any underscore underscore function which we call a constructor that will and that is the first function that will be called when I create a new instance of my class. Here I have some methods or functions that act upon the attributes of my class. The way I define attributes or variables is by using the self keyword which refers to the class and I assign some values here. So uh, it will be more explicit uh, with the example right after but here I specify some arguments in my constructors. When I create a person I need those parameters here and then I assign those parameters to that person using the self keyword as it refers to the current instance of that class. Just as an example, here I create a new variable Alice of type person, so that's the name of my class, and here I pass in what is expected here. But don't forget the self as a first parameter. So name, age, university, and then in my constructor, so on in that line, that function in it is being called and I assign all the parameters that were given to me to uh, the current instance because I don't want to lose them because self refers to the current instance that I'm working on. The way uh, there's a distinction between class and object in that class is sort of the blueprint of uh, your, your type we, so it's just this without any uh, sort of uh, values in, in it. And an object or instance is once I create a class with actual values, it becomes an, an instance or an object. So it depends on the context. We say it is instantiated once uh, it's been through the constructor and has actually been built. Otherwise, this class really just acts as a blueprint. Then the really cool thing is that I can just reuse my class in different instances with different values. So here I have Alice and here I have Bob that is of the same type. So it's a variable of type person, but with different values. So the name is Bob, the age is 17 and the university is UCO. Then I define methods or functions that act upon the variables stored in my object. So here, the notation is name of your instance, so Alice or Bob in that context, dot, and the name of the method. So here, if I run that, I have, if I call is over 18 uh, on my instance of Alice, I get true, but if I call it on Bob, I get false here. And here I have the present uh, method that takes in the self, so the, the instance, and returns uh, this sentence with just the person presenting themselves. 
So just more on the self uh, parameter here, because that uh, is quite curious. This is actually shorthand for, so I'm doing, for instance, bob.present here, and I'm not passing anything here, but here I have a parameter. This is because this notation, the dot notation here, is actually shorthand for present bob. So actually, I call this function and self takes the value of Bob or Alice if I did Alice.present. And so you can imagine that every self here will be replaced with the uh, Bob. So here, Bob.present will, will run present with Bob as self and it will, it will run hi, I'm Bob.name, Bob.age on both the, the university. So that's about it for basic Python and it's a brief overview of more or less what we'll be using throughout our workshop series. If you feel uncom uncomfortable with certain concepts, uh, you should feel free to brush up on, uh, on that in your free time and because uh, then we're gonna move on more onto uh, data science and machine learning using uh, those uh, basic concepts. Right, so now we'll go over our first library, which is NumPy. A library is a set of functions and classes and code that was written by someone else or some other people that you can use yourself. And NumPy specifically is used for computing and is used a lot for creating n-dimensional arrays in a very efficient way. The way we start is by using that syntax, so import will import uh, a library. So we import NumPy and we alias it as np. So when we refer to NumPy, we'll have to refer to NP, and this is easier because it's uh, shorter. So I'll just run that. So the main thing about NumPy is arrays. The way we create an array is by, so I'm creating a variable here, is by using np.array, and here I'm passing in a Python list to my array, or to the uh, array constructor, and that will create an array for me. Then, once I have my array, I can index it. So similarly to Python, uh, the notation is this with two colons and, uh, and three um, positioned arguments. The way this works is A here is the starting in index. Oh, I need to run that. B is the end index and c is the step so it's a bit like the range function if you recall that notice that a is inclusive b is exclusive and c uh, is just uh, default to one those arguments here carry default values a for instance if it's not specified defaults to zero b defaults to the end of the array and c defaults to one so here for instance this is just a very basic uh, indexing with a square bracket notation. So here I'm getting the second element because it's zero indexed. So that just prints two. We also have a handy notation using negative numbers, which index uh, from the end instead of from the start of the array. So that will give me the last item, which is five. Here I have two parameters, A and B, which are one and three. So I'm indexing from one inclusive to three exclusive. So the first index is two and three is zero, one, two, three is four. So that will give me two, three because the third index, so four is exclusive. Here I have A, but I don't have B. And B here defaults to the end of the array. So I'm taking from the first index until the end. So that will just omit the first element. Similarly here, I've omitted the first parameter here. So that defaults to zero, it's the A parameter that defaults to zero until index two. So that will give us zero, one, and two, which is exclusive, so just one, two. Here, a bit more complicated, we have, so A is not specified, B is not specified, and c is 2. So a defaults to 0, b defaults to the end of the array, 
and we have a step of two. So essentially it's taking the whole array, but with a step of two. So that gives us one, three, five. That notation can be a bit confusing at first, so I really recommend uh, you go uh, over it and get some practice if you feel you need it. Further on, we have a lot of handy uh, methods to create some specific arrays. For instance, zeros, which takes in a uh, number as a parameter, and that will create an array of all zeros. We can also, however, specify a more complex shape. So remember how I said NumPy can create n-dimensional arrays. So here I can pass in a list with multiple dimensions, so two, three, four, and that will create a 3D array for me. And I can have a 2D matrix uh, like that. So that for actually would be a tensor. And uh, further on, I can have uh, four dimensions or any number of dimensions, although it becomes quite complicated to uh, visualize and manipulate after. Similarly, as with zeros, I have ones. So here I'm just creating a matrix of uh, three by three and of all ones. We can, so as I was saying, we can just create any sort of uh, dimension of, uh, of matrix uh, we want just by specifying the shape here. And then to access it, what we do is we chain the square bracket operator here to access a specific element. So here, actually I'm creating all zeros, so it's not surprising that will be zero. But here I'm accessing the first index over the first dimension, the second index over the second dimension, and here the zeroth index over the third dimension. Something to notice is that every time you use the square bracket notation, you go down one dimension. For instance, so here, tensor is three dimension. If I do this, so I access the first index of the first dimension, I go down to a matrix of two dimensions. Here, if I access, say, the zeroth index of the second dimension, I go down to a vector. And then again, if I access, say, the second index, I go down to a scalar. So every time you use that bracket operator, you go down one dimension. So now a quick word about slicing. So here I have a matrix and I can use a comma in my indexing notation to specify where to slice on which dimensions. Specifically here, uh, so I'm using that bracket notation, I'm, I'm specifying on the first dimension which rows I'm selecting. So that's the same notation if you remember the ABC notation. So here it's from zero, so the beginning until the end of the array. So select all rows and here are columns zero to two. So that will just give us the first two columns. And if I run that, we get that. For instance, if I were to put a one here, I would omit the first row. So I would just have uh, those two, uh, uh, like three, four, six, seven, nine, ten here. Next up, we have Boolean indexing. Here I'm using a new method, uh, a range, which just creates an array from zero until the specified number. So it's like just a Python uh, range uh, function. Here, again, with the square bracket notation, I can specify a Boolean expression that will get evaluated against every element and filter the array. So here, I have my array that goes from zero to nine. And I'm like, okay, give me all the elements that are strictly smaller than five. So that gives me zero, one, two, three, four. Here I go, give, apply modulo two to all the elements. So modulo two is the rest of the integer division and give me all the elements that have a rest of zero. So that gives me all the even numbers. So zero, two, four, six, eight. Next up, we have uh, shapes, which are very useful for uh, instance, debugging the array objects you're uh, manipulating. So here I'm creating an array of one dimension of size three. And if I print its shape, I just get three. Here I have a matrix 
of 3 by 3 and using the shape uh, attribute it returns me 3 3 furthermore here I'm creating again a, an array from 0 to 9 so that one and I can use the reshape function to specify a new shape I want to give it so here it reshapes it into a matrix of 3 by 3 a short uh, hand that we can use is that if we know all the dimensions but one uh, NumPy can uh, easily determine the last dimension uh, for us so we use the negative one notation so here uh, I initially have uh, one dimension of size 9 I want to reshape it into two dimensions the first one being three and then if I know all dimensions but one then I can determine the last so here in NumPy will just determine first that uh, the last dimension has to be of uh, size 3 as well now with all that we can use a lot of uh, very handy and uh, optimized and efficient operations on our arrays so for instance here I'm creating uh, again an array from 0 to 9 and here's just a very quick snippet of what you can do with it so this will multiply it element wise this will divide all the elements by two this will sum the array this will take the mean of the array and this will do a dot product uh, with itself now so this is really sort of the value that numpy brings is creating n-dimensional arrays and then having those really handy functions to manipulate them this is really just a very quick overview of it I really recommend you look up the NumPy documentation and look up any operations you would need for, for your projects. So that will really depend on what you're doing. Say for instance, I need a matrix multiplication. Uh, I'll just Google like NumPy matrix multiplication and here you'll find a documentation for the MATMO uh, function. So you can just use that then in your project and you have very efficient matrix multiplication. And this is really what's interesting with NumPy. It's making uh, some really sort of uh, sometimes convoluted uh, linear algebra uh, very useful to use uh, through like really easy notation and you know it's uh, efficient and will run fast. So now we'll go over our second library, which is uh, Pandas. And uh, Pandas is used uh, for manipulating data and uh, loading and storing it. The way we start, similarly to NumPy, is by importing pandas and aliasing it as a PD, so it's uh, easier to and shorter to write. The two main features that pandas is used for are series and data frames. So series are one-dimensional array-like objects which have an index. So this is, you might have heard of time series, for instance, where every value has a uh, is attributed a point in time so for instance for financial data but essentially this is really just represents anything that for any value has an index for instance to create one here i use pd.series i pass in a python list with just my list of values and here i pass in uh, my indices so if i run that here on the like the first column is my index and here I have the values associated to uh, every index. So here I can use the square bracket notation like a Python list or array or NumPy array and get the third element uh, index two. So this will just give me 56. Also note that here I'm passing in the index, but I could do without it. This is because my index is quite redundant as it's just uh, indexing starting from zero and incrementing by one. But if I had, say, a more complex index, I could here pass some uh, some timestamp, like so timestamp one, timestamp two, etc., and that would work as well. So here, as my index, I could actually have timestamps. So again, that's the example of financial series. Next up, we have data frames, which are very similar, but are two dimensional. So they also have an index, but they can have multiple columns. The way I create a data frame is I use pd.dataFrame and I pass in a dictionary where the keys are the names of my columns and the values are lists containing the values in every column. So if I run that, I get my data frame with my index here, 0, 1, 
on my column one with the values here, on my column two with the values here. Note that there are many different ways of uh, creating a data frame, so I recommend you look up the documentation on the Pandas website, which is very well written, and you will see all the different ways you can uh, create a data frame. But this is one of the main ways of doing it. On the data frame, if I use the bracket notation uh, like that, that will work. I get a key error. This is because a data frame cannot be indexed using just an integer. The bracket notation is used, is used to select columns like that. So this, uh, so I take my data frame and this notation selects the first column and is actually giving me uh, a series here. If I want to access a row, I have to use dot iloc for integer location here, and this will give me the second row. So I have my two columns and two four. This is my second row. Right, so let's look at an example here using a World Health Organization dataset. So the way we start is by loading our dataset, which is located under the data directory. So I can use the pd.read underscore csv file. This is because our file is formatted as csv. You also have uh, methods like read excel and uh, maybe for other formats as well. csv stands for comma separated values. And this is because our file is uh, formatted just with loads of values uh, separated by a separator, which in our case is a comma. We can print the length of uh, our data set. So we have 2,938 entries. And there's a very handy function called head that will just print the first five elements. So this gives us the structure of our data frame. So we have data about uh, countries and a lot of stats about them. So like the life expectancy, the infant uh, mortality rate, the uh, polio rate, and so on and so on. And uh, we'll see uh, what we can do with that. Also, you'll see that there's an ellipsis here, so we cannot see all the columns. If you want to see all the columns, you can just print uh, data.columns, and here it will give you uh, an index object with an array of all the columns of your data frame. Now you'll notice that our data is actually quite messy. For instance here, we, uh, we have spaces in our column names, which uh, means that when we use the square bracket operator, we actually have to put the spaces in the name, which is a bit of pain. So this can be used to demonstrate how to rename uh, columns. So I can use the rename method and pass in a dictionary where I specify a key as a key, the column I want to rename and as value the, the new name for my column. So here I just did it for two columns, but this is how you could rename the columns. If I run that, you see that for instance, uh, life expectancy, it used to have a space here and um, now it's just renamed uh, as just life expectancy without a space and just uh, lower letters. Also, if we further look, so for instance here, I'm printing the 33rd row, you'll see that we have NAN values, which stands for not a number, and this is just uh, missing data. And uh, ideally, we want to clear this and just keep the rows that have all the data. To do that, we use the drop NA uh, function, and that shrinks down our data set to 1649 entries. But there are other ways uh, to do that. You could fill those values with some other default values like zero, but we don't that we don't want that in our case because that would just uh, give a lot of uh, fake uh, like false information. And uh, also what you could do is if you have some columns that depend on other columns, you could use the other columns to compute the right value, but this is not uh, our case either. Pretty much the only thing we can do here is just uh, drop those rows. Now to select data from our data set, we can use this notation where here I'm selecting all the entries that have as country Ukraine. So that gives me uh, 15 rows. I can use any sort of Boolean operator here. So for instance here, I want all the countries that have hepatitis B rates lower than five. And the, that gives me eight rows. Now very useful, is uh, grouping. 
what grouping allows us to do, uh, people who are familiar with uh, SQL uh, might know that already, but they allow you to, from one big data frame, create lots of smaller data frames that have the same values in a certain column. For instance, here, I'm grouping by country, and uh, you can ignore that for now, but essentially all I'm doing is I'm taking my data set, grouping by country, and uh, printing the output. And that gives us lots of data frames. So you can see here the data frames are separated. And here I have a data frame with only the country of Afghanistan, here are the, con the data frame with only the country of Albania, and here Algeria, etc. So essentially I'm grouping everything whoops, into different data frames per country. And then using the apply uh, method, I can pass in a function that will be applied to every sub data frame. For instance, here I define a per country function that takes in a data frame, so that will be one of the sub data frames, and I return the mean of the life expectancy for the data frame. So what that does is that it gives me a new data frame with a country, and for every country, the mean of its life expectancy, uh, given uh, all the smaller data frames uh, it, it was uh, given. And so this is really useful to do uh, any sort of uh, data aggregation where you have loads of data with uh, some uh, common value and you want to aggregate uh, per country or per value. And so this is really useful to do the, those types of computation. Now we'll end by seeing how we can actually plot data. We'll use matplotlib and import it here on the as PLT. This line here is just a directive for the Python notebook to display the graphs in line. If you're using a normal Python file and not a Jupyter notebook, uh, you don't need that line. A very useful function that can be used, so this is directly on the pandas data frame, is the hist method. And that will just display a histogram of uh, the values of a certain column. For instance here, this can be used to assess whether data is balanced or unbalanced. And you can see here that it is uh, fairly balanced. We can use the max method to get uh, the country that has the most occurrences. So we have uh, Zimbabwe here, or min, here is Afghanistan. Next up here, again, if we look at the histogram of GDP, we can see it's extremely uneven, and we have an overwhelming majority of GDP values between uh, 0 and uh, 10,000. Now to use matplotlib, we can use uh, the scatter method, which will allow us, allow us to display uh, points. Here we pass in our column of GDP, and here our column of uh, life expectancy. So we want to measure life expectancy against GDP. We label our x-axis with GDP and our y-axis with life expectancy, and we give a nifty title to, to our graph. And if I run that, this is uh, the result we get. Now that wraps it up for this first workshop. We'll be using what we've seen here quite extensively throughout our series, so it's important to set a good base for that. If you want to get more experience, I recommend picking up a small project and playing around with what we saw today. We also have a problem sheet, which you will find uh, right next to the notebook here. So you might want to go that, uh, over that as well. In the next workshop, we'll go over regression and how we can fit a curve to our graph. So make sure you're subscribed to our mailing list to get the latest updates and until next time. Yeah, so this is uh, yeah. what we saw in the beginning, how to define a, a function. It's going fast. <laughs> we had 54, I oh know. 58, I think, maximum, something like that. Nice. So yeah, some languages use like curly braces and yeah. stuff like that. So Python is just kind of yeah. Yeah, nice. the syntax in Python is a colon and then the indents. Okay. All right. So we've got this is the top five so far. Yes.
Maria indexing. So remember which uh, which ones were inclusive and which ones were exclusive. Was very uh, spread out. Yeah, so do, can do you, you go on there or not to explain? Uh, yeah. Show me. Yeah, I can. Oh, cool. cool. That's really bad quality, but yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have uh, our array. So, first off, remember they are zero indexed and not uh, one indexed. So, we start at index one. So, that's two inclusive up to five. For now, ignore the, the two. So, we go from one to five. Uh, five excluded, so we take. No. So, so it's like we're only considering two, three, and four because like five is excluded. That's, yeah. Like, it's know. index five, which is the sixth element. Oh, yeah. No, we have two, three, four, five. I believe. Yep. And uh, step two, so we have that array two, three, four, five, and step two. So we uh, just take, uh, we we go uh, uh, yeah, two sorry, by two. I'm just dumb. Yeah. It can be quite confusing, confusing with all the what's inclusive, what's exclusive, uh, and so we just have that sub array two, three, four, five, and we just uh, start from the first one and go steps of two. So that just leaves us with two and four. Okay, so yeah, top five. We've got a new leader. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So remember the map uh, function and the lambdas. Some people are hesitating. Yep, yeah, should we go over that again? Yeah, go. Uh, so there you go. Yeah, actually, I think yeah, most people got it right. It's just uh, there's a confusion between yeah this and that. It's because it's uh, times two and not power of two. Yeah. So to to so, do power of two, it will be like double star. Double star, yeah. X star star two. But yeah, apart from that, everyone got the main the gist of it. Yeah. So awesome. that that's the only confusion, I guess. Oh, actually, on that one, uh, did you? OK, yeah, we can go. I'll go over that later. Don't worry. Let's just keep going with the quiz. Yeah, so uh, what happens is, uh, so we have two integers, so uh, that's right, and uh, Python automatically converts it to a float when you do a, uh, 
a division, uh, unlike a lot of other languages. So that's why I think uh, some people were confused. Uh, so if you do that in uh, Python, you would get as output uh, 0 0.5, whereas if you were to do that in, say, uh, C++, you would get 0, because you would get the integer division. But Python automatically converts it uh, as a float. Actually, could I, uh, yeah, going back to the previous question, I might just, before I forget. So when there was yeah. the, I'll just work out Python here. Oh, we can't see. We are only seeing a browser. Yeah. Oh, cool. See here? Uh, I'll just yeah. do it in, um, oh, yeah, there we go. Just doing terminal. So when we had A equals, for example, what was that? Oops. So was one, two, three, two, three, three right? And then we did the map of, uh, so we said, Something like, um, let's call this B. We did list, mapping, lambda, x, x times times 2 of A, right? Mm -hmm. uh, two arguments, yeah, that's two arguments, isn't it? Uh, you, you forgot a... Uh, yeah, there we go. So that's, yeah, I oh, forgot this one here. Yeah. Sorry, okay. So yeah, if we do print B, then we get the 2, 4... Uh, six. But as you can see, this is quite like um, like complicated looking. It's like there's loads of things going on. Uh, another way of doing it would be doing something like this. So x times two for x in a. So this is like it, this is just kind of a inline for loop in a way. It's called a list comprehension. Yeah, it's a list comprehension. So it's essentially this is your function. This is our lambda. So it's like like behind the hood, it's uh, very similar. So uh, yeah, it takes an element x, multiplies it by two for each x in a. So it goes element by element and applying this to it, and it returns kind of. See, so like they're the same. Uh, it's probably a bit easier, like to read, and uh, it's probably what you'll be using uh, most of the time. Yeah, sorry, I just uh, it's got quite like a. Useful thing. I tend to use that quite a lot. So Worth before. noting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next question. Okay, we've got a new leader again. Yeah, we haven't seen much more, but it's matrix multiplication. So remember uh, how matrices are created in NumPy. What happens if we multiply A and B with the matrix product? Do you want to show the... Yeah, so I'll show the thing. It's a bit yeah. too big, but okay. Oh, it's fine, it's fine. Okay, so what we're doing is uh, we're creating uh, two matrices. So A is a matrix. Remember uh, what's passed in argument one, two is are the dimensions. It's not the, it's not a, it doesn't create an array. It, it, those are the dimensions of the matrix. So A will be a uh, one by two uh, matrix of just ones and B will be a two by three matrix of uh, just ones. And so if you multiply a one by two by a two by three matrix, uh, you get a three uh, matrix. Okay. Uh, yeah. So yes, well, it, there was a confusion mainly between the two and two. So, so yeah, it's like the twos kind of get absorbed. Like they, that's what you multiply on. So, mm. okay. All right, next mm. one. <laughs> okay, two to go. Yeah, about pandas. How can you access the fifth row of a, a data frame?
Cool. So, uh, first off, <laughs> again, <laughs> and this is a star uh, uh, <laughs> zero. So, if you're on the fifth row, uh, you need index four. So, everything that has index five uh, uh, will not be correct. And uh, then uh, the notation, which I agree can be a, a bit confusing, is where is with the square brackets and not uh, uh, parentheses. Yeah, okay. Cool. Next one. So this is the last one, right? Yeah. There are actually uh, two uh, solutions to that. Yeah, so you have to click the two solutions and then click submit. Oh, we have a lot of very sensitive. So uh, that one was a bit tricky. Uh, first off, for red, uh, the size uh, function uh, doesn't exist. It's a uh, len for length. Uh, for blue, what we're doing is that we have our data frame. We're selecting the column uh, country and counting all the elements. So all we're doing here is essentially counting all the rows because we're taking all the rows of country and just counting everything, which uh, we don't do with uh, green because uh, we use the unique method. So we remove all the duplicates and then we take uh, the length of that. And uh, for yellow, we first group by country. So we go from one big data frame to lots of smaller data frames by country and we take the length of that which essentially returns just the number of uh, smaller data frames we have. And since they're grouped by country, we get the number of unique countries. Yeah. Cool, so is that it? Yeah, that's it. So yeah, I mean, it was just a, I guess a simple group, but then hopefully cleared up some misconceptions. So anyway, the winners, so we've got it's yeah, N, and then on second place, we've got three flowers. <laughs> and then, but yeah, so, uh, I guess if we actually go to, because uh, we said top five, so if we view the full report, yep, uh, we should be able to see the top five. So this is right. So, so yeah, if you guys could uh, set your, like, write in the chat yeah. the username and also uh, a way to contact you. If you're from Imperial, you can just post us your virtual code. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, thanks for. Uh, for coming guys uh, we hope you've uh, you've liked uh, this uh, workshop this was really introductory uh, material because we want kind of to get everyone up to speed uh, next time we'll go into regression and the, the basis of uh, neural networks and then we'll progress uh, further uh, so feel free to uh, uh, stick around if you have any other questions uh, yeah go ahead